Good evening. This is the Digital Age. I'm Jim Zirin. Tonight we have a very special program for you on the botched firings of eight United States attorneys all over the country. Last December, Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez announced the dismissals and the initial indication was that they were performance related. Subsequent emails, however, told a different tale, suggesting that the eight had been victims of a political purge. Thereafter, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle called for Gonzalez to resign. He will testify, the Attorney General will testify, before the Senate Judiciary Committee next Tuesday, April 17th. And here's what a member of that committee, Senator Charles Schumer, told Bob Schieffer on Face the Nation about the situation. Senator Schumer, uh, what do you think ought to be done about this situation? Well, Bob, you know, the Justice Department is different than any other department. Uh, in every other department, the cabinet, chief cabinet officer is supposed to follow the president's uh, orders, requests without exception. But the Justice Department has a higher responsibility, rule of law, and the Constitution. And Attorney General Gonzalez in his department has been even more political than his predecessor, uh, Attorney General Ashcroft. Attorney General Gonzalez is a nice man, but he either doesn't accept or doesn't understand that he is no longer just the president's lawyer, but has a higher obligation to the rule of law and the Constitution, even when the president should not want it to be so. And so this department has been so political that I think for the sake of the nation, Attorney General Gonzalez should step down. Our guest tonight is an expert on the independent role of the prosecutor. He is Richard Benvenisti. He is a former prosecutor himself, a Watergate special prosecutor. He's a member of the 9-11 Commission, and he is a Washington lawyer. Uh, Richard, welcome. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, former speaker uh, Newt Gingrich said that this is the most mishandled, artificial, self-created mess that I can remember. Now, I've never known you to agree with uh, Newt Gingrich before, but you agree with him here. Well, I can't disagree with his memory, uh, although it doesn't uh, raise my threshold for surprise <laughs> in Washington. I've seen quite a bit of bungling over time. But this is a pretty sad case where you see a defense of incompetence raised to a charge of venality. So uh, the administration, and particularly General Gonzalez, is in a pretty tight spot at the moment. Uh, let's talk about venality. Uh, what do you think was behind the firings? Well, I'm not going to speculate. And in fact, I don't think we've seen all the evidence yet. Indeed, there are emails uh, which apparently were sent on an unapproved email service for Karl Rove. Uh, the president's close advisor. Uh, under the Presidential Records Act, uh, presidential appointees in the executive department are obliged to use official uh, White House emails for their communications, and yet it has recently been learned that Mr. Rove was communicating on a Republican National Committee email system as well as a personal email system and so they are now trying to retrieve uh, those emails in which uh, purportedly there were discussion about these firings. Now, under the law, the official White House emails have to be preserved as part of the presidential archive, isn't that right? That's correct. And the personal emails, evidently, uh, some of which uh, it has been admitted related to the firings of the eight, uh, the Gonzales eight, uh, those have apparently been deleted, uh, can't be found. I mean, do you credit that story? Well, I think they are temporarily missing, MIA. Uh, but uh, whether they can be retrieved uh, is another question. Uh, as you probably know, uh, it is difficult to totally obliterate electronic messages. And they are kept in any number of different storage ways, um, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, there are ways of recovering deleted emails, and we will see whether those procedures will be used here. Uh, now, uh, 
you see some propriety in a uh, member of the government using a private email account to uh, transact, transact governmental business. I mean, for example, if Vice President Cheney used a Halliburton account uh, to send uh, uh, messages to people, uh, uh, there would be something very wrong with that. Wouldn't yes. you agree? I think so. Uh, uh, of course, uh, one could differentiate, presumably, between personal and family and so forth. but. Here we are talking uh, about emails relating to government business, that is, the retention or firing of government employees, the United States attorneys uh, who were ultimately fired uh, in connection with the eight uh, mass firings. And so those communications, uh, one would uh, strongly suspect, are official communications which should not have been uh, circumvented uh, by using a non-official email uh, source. Well, now, uh, some of the emails, official emails that were produced, uh, were what lawyers call redacted. There was material that was edited out. And uh, the reason it was edited out, it was claimed, was uh, the White House counsel said there's an executive privilege uh, with respect to part of the emails. Uh, would executive privilege apply to the emails on these private accounts? You know, I don't think so, and I don't think that they will be, uh, because they have been uh, put on non-executive uh, email servers, uh, subject to the same claim. So in a sense, they are less protected uh, than if they had been sent uh, through the official uh, channels. Uh, now, uh, do you believe that uh, uh, the firings were carried out under, according to the evidence which has thus far been produced, the emails that went back and forth between Harriet Myers in the White House and uh, Kyle Sampson in the Justice Department and others, were carried out as part of a blatantly partisan uh, political campaign? Well, partisan is okay. And political is okay. Well, what's not okay, Jim, is if a individual were fired because that person uh, either did not act in accordance with the political wishes of someone who, for political purposes, wanted that U.S. attorney to take particular action. And that would be the case of Mr. David Iglesias, uh, who was the United States Attorney in New Mexico, who claims that he was fired specifically because he would not return an indictment against a Democrat uh, in his state uh, after he was importuned to do so uh, by two elected members of Congress. And so if Senator that... Senator Domenici and a uh, congresswoman from correct. New Mexico. Correct. So if that assertion uh, were correct, that would be very inappropriate and possibly violative of the law. Well, let's take uh, John McKay, highly respected prosecutor in the state of Washington. Uh, he claims he was dismissed because he refused to start a grand jury investigation arising out of the Washington state gubernatorial election uh, in 2004, where the Democrat won by less than 200 votes. So there would be uh, considerable similarity between Mr. McKay's assertion and Mr. Iglesias' assertion. And on the other hand, uh, Carol Lamb, who was the United States Attorney in the Southern District of California in San Diego, was investigating a very high-level uh, Republican uh, elected and appointed officials. and. Uh, it has been uh, asserted that her investigation was uh, somehow truncated as a result of her being fired. See, all of this is in the context of the initial claim that these eight individuals were fired for performance reasons, that they were not performing in a way commensurate with their obligations. Now, as you pointed out in your opening, at first uh, this assertion was made, then it was modified, then it was reasserted. Then when Mr. Sampson, Mr. Uh, Gonzalez's administrative assistant, his chief assistant, testified, he testified 
um, that with respect to Mr. Iglesias, uh, he now recognizes that he shouldn't be fired, and uh, he apologized. And in the course of his testimony, then contradicted uh, Mr. Gonzalez's prior, uh, prior statements regarding the extent of Mr. Gonzalez's knowledge and participation in the decision-making process. Let's just look at these emails uh, for a moment because uh, they are quite uh, interesting and uh, uh, several of them are, uh, are, are pretty extraordinary. As early as March 2nd, 2005, uh, Kyle Sampson sent an email to Harriet Myers at the White House in which he elaborated a grading system for United States attorneys. And we have that email. Uh, our viewers will see it on the screen. And uh, the first category of grade uh, was uh, bold, called bold, uh, recommend retaining strong U.S. attorneys who produced, managed well, and exhibited loyalty to the president and the attorney general. Do you think that's a fair criterion for uh, keeping or replacing a Well, not a attorney? personal loyalty. Uh, one could phrase it in a way uh, uh, that reflected a, a fealty to the priorities of a particular administration and an attorney general within that administration, but certainly not a, 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 a personal sort of uh, loyalty. Look, a United States attorney, when he takes office or she takes office, uh, really pledges to uphold the law in a nonpartisan way, and that's what we expect. You and I have both served uh, a great United States attorney, Robert Morgenthau. I served in the office of Mike Seymour, one a Democrat, one a Republican. In both cases, the uh, hiring was done on a completely apolitical basis, nonpartisan. No one ever asked us when we applied for the job whether we were Democrats or Republicans. And indeed, the very actions of uh, our bosses show that they were non-political in that decision-making process. And that is a critically important piece of the American justice system, that Americans can have confidence in those people who are on the front lines of our federal justice system, and that their decisions are based on the facts and the law and not on political considerations. Well, let's look at another grade that uh, Sampson and Myers gave the sitting U.S. attorneys. It was, the grade was strikeout. I guess that's an F. And they said, recommend removing weak U.S. attorneys who have been ineffectual managers chafed against administration initiatives. I mean, is that a fair criterion for dismissing a U.S. attorney? They chafe it, against it's administration it's, initiatives? It depends on what the initiatives are. I mean, if the initiatives uh, are uh, uh, totally inconsistent with the community standards and the priorities that are expected in a particular place, if you have uh, an area such as New York and uh, there's a suggestion that crimes involving financial transactions should not be pursued in favor of pornography, uh, or some other administrative uh, administration um, uh, suggestion, uh, then one would have to balance the importance of, a, of an office like that in safeguarding uh, the finances and financial affairs of Wall Street against uh, violators of the law versus uh, other priorities. So I think you'd have to look at it on a district by district basis. It's conceivably uh, legitimate, but as we see it applied to these individuals, it falls apart. Well, pornography is very relevant now that you've said it, because there, among the eight who were dismissed, there were two, one in Las Vegas and one in Tucson, Arizona, uh, both of whom uh, refused to bring pornography cases at the behest of the Justice Department. And we have an email, uh, which our viewers will see, where uh, a member of the Justice Department uh, quotes the Attorney General as saying we have to take names and kick butt. And so he's reporting these two and putting them on the, the list for uh, dismissal because they wouldn't do a pornography case. So it's an example of just what you said. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what the facts are there. Um, and once again, I think there, there aren't uh, U.S. attorneys who would turn down a blatant case of child pornography 
for these example. weren't. I think it was a case where uh, it involved uh, adult films uh, that were uh, shown at a trade fair in uh, Las Vegas. As opposed to a hotel room in uh, any place you wanted to go in the United States. That's I mean, right. I mean, uh, this obviously um, could reflect uh, a deviation from what United States attorneys uh, are really expected to do. You uh, mentioned uh, the legendary prosecutor, uh, uh, Bob Morgenthau, and also Mike Seymour. I remember in the Morgenthau years, uh, prominent Democrats, Morgenthau was a Democrat, prominent Democrats were indicted. Uh, he uh, brought uh, an indictment against uh, close aides of Speaker John McCormick. Well, I prosecuted you, that case. And you prosecuted that case. And then in the Seymour years, I think Attorney General Mitchell uh, directed Seymour to indict the New York Times after the Pentagon paper case and papers case, and he refused. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, John Mitchell was prosecuted. And John Mitchell was prosecuted. So, uh, so that uh, uh, in both cases, Jim, you correctly point out, in Morgenthau's case, the administrative assistant to a Democratic Speaker of the House uh, was prosecuted first for perjury and then for uh, bribery and, and convicted uh, in, in both cases. And believe me, Washington, official Washington, was not happy with that. Uh, but Morgenthau uh, called it the way he saw it, as did Mike Seymour. Uh, now, uh, we are really greeted with a sorry spectacle in uh, the Palace of Justice. Three top aides to Attorney General Gonzalez of already resigned or been fired. Uh, Mike Battle of the uh, uh, Chief of uh, the Executive Office of United States Attorneys, uh, Kyle Sampson who testified. Uh, and then there's Monica Goodling who took the Fifth Amendment and is now seeking immunity before she testifies before the Congress. Uh, have you any idea why she would take the Fifth Amendment about her conduct? As well, a, I, cer I certainly don't know uh, anything um, beyond what's been reported. Jim, what's been reported is that she was concerned that uh, there is so much tension and there have been so many different versions of stories uh, told that she's concerned if she testifies under oath, she might be subject uh, to a perjury prosecution. Unfortunately, the fallacy in the argument uh, requesting immunity is that you cannot get immunity for perjury. Once an individual is granted immunity, and Congress has the ability uh, to grant immunity, it is interesting to know who at the Justice Department will uh, play the role of passing on uh, the recommendation of Congress that immunity be granted. Uh, but putting that aside, you are not immunized or uh, prevented from being prosecuted if you testify falsely. And so you're back where you started. If your concern is a uh, is jeopardy that your words can be used against you in a false statement case. Uh, now, uh, Ms. Goodling uh, attended Regent Law School. I think uh, before uh, all this happened, there were a few lawyers who had heard of Regent Law School. It's considered it's rated by U.S. News and World Report as a fourth-tier law school. It's uh, faith-based, the, the old name of it was CBN for Christian Broadcasting Network, was founded by Pat Robertson. And uh, 150 graduates of that school were employed in this administration by the federal government, many of them by the Department of Justice. Is that troubling at all to you? Well, I, I hadn't heard that figure before, Jim, and I certainly uh, cast no aspersions against uh, any particular law school. Individuals who uh, pass the bar uh, are entitled to practice law, no matter where they uh, went to law school. Uh, some long time ago, you didn't even have to go to law school to be a lawyer. So I would uh, uh, evaluate each individual on the basis of individual merit. Uh, one individual, one United States attorney who appears to have played ball was the U.S. attorney in Wisconsin, uh, Mr. Steve Buscapic, uh, who prosecuted uh, during election season a Democratic state employee, Georgia Thompson, on uh, charges of bid rigging. 
Uh, it's claimed that he did that in order to try to sw uh, sway the election because uh, the charge was that she steered a, a state contract to a uh, donor campaign contributor to Democratic Governor James Doyle, who was running for office. Uh, the Seventh Circuit, after oral argument, ordered her freed uh, and then overturned the conviction on appeal. Uh, is that uh, possibly, and, and Senator Leahy has said he wants to, all the information about that prosecution and communications with the Department of Justice. Would you take that as an example of uh, the Justice Department impinging on the um, independence of the prosecutor? Well, I don't know if the prosecutor uh, initiated that uh, uh, prosecution without prompting or pressure by the government, as uh, Mr. Iglesias said he was pressured to do in the case that we've talked about earlier, uh, perhaps not. I don't know the facts in that case, and uh, uh, I really don't feel comfortable commenting on it. Um, what does all this do in your judgment to uh, the status and stature of the legal profession? I mean, is it undermining that our independent federal prosecutors may become political apparatchiks doing the benefit, of, uh, the, doing the bidding of a, uh, uh, a national administration that has an agenda? Well, it has had and will continue to, to have until uh, there's some resolution of these facts, a, a terrible effect on the morale of very dedicated and hardworking uh, United States attorneys and assistant United States attorneys throughout the nation. Um, this is a terrible thing to happen. Uh, when you use the term apparatchik, you know, Kyle Sampson comes to mind. Here's an individual who purports to be passing on the future careers of individuals <clears throat> who has apparently had no practical experience as uh, being a prosecutor, being an assistant United States attorney, a state's a assistant district attorney, or any such uh, job in which he would be qualified to evaluate what U.S. attorneys and their assistants do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, when you look at these emails, they are rather revolting when he seems to be a uh, quite the syncopant uh, anticipating uh, what Karl Rove would uh, be happy with and then acting uh, with little more than like a lapdog in trying to please his master. Uh, Carl Rove's people would be delighted at this, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, Carl would agree with this, or if Carl agrees, then I would uh, be happy to support this idea. Uh, I mean, this is not what you want in the federal judiciary, and I don't think you, you see it. It is certainly completely unrepresentative of uh, United States attorneys, uh, career people at the Justice Department, uh, and there are many, many of them who are uh, reacting with uh, uh, shock and, and horror at these revelations. Uh, one of the things that might have made Karl Rove happy uh, was in Arkansas, where uh, Monica Goodling wanted to replace the U.S. Attorney uh, Bud Cummins, who was uh, indeed uh, fired, uh, with uh, Tim Griffin, who was a, a close associate of Rove and one of his protégés. And Griffin said he wouldn't seek uh, uh, Senate confirmation because uh, under the Patriot Act, if it was an interim appointment, uh, it didn't need Senate confirmation. Uh, so what do you make of that? Well, uh, that's an excellent point, actually. Uh, one of the things that first caught my attention was a very cynical misuse of the amendment to the Patriot Act uh, that circumvents the Senate's uh, advise and consent responsibility in terms of confirming interim appointees. So that according to the emails that have been released already, it seems uh, that uh, individuals in the Justice Department, such as Mr. Sampson, were planning their moves based on the fact that these individuals would never be subject to Senate confirmation that they would be replaced with interim appointees. And then in one string of emails, he talks about 
slow walking the process, assuaging the concerns of the senators from the uh, relevant states uh, by telling them we're looking into it, we're thinking about it, and all the time running the clock. And then very cynically uses, and of course all of this would be done in, quote, good faith. So I think that was one of the more uh, revolting and, and, and certainly to me uh, having some considerable interest in the Patriot Act and the provisions of it, which, which was amended in this case to provide for emergency cir uh, circumstances, exigencies, when there wouldn't be time uh, to have a full confirmation hearing. And yet this is used for blatantly uh, political purposes completely unrelated uh, to what the Patriot Act was supposed to address. Uh, and uh, we have all that in emails, so would that be an example of what you referred to at the beginning as incompetence or an example of venality? Or both? Well, I think the uh, uh, certainly uh, a misuse of the provisions of the, of the Patriot Act, and I think uh, Congress will get around to looking into whether, in fact, those provisions uh, were put forward by the administration with this very process in mind of circumventing for political uh, rather than uh, emergency anti-terrorist reasons. Uh, the non-confirmation of interim appointed U.S. attorneys. Now, you were a Watergate special prosecutor on, uh, at the time of the, the Saturday Night Massacre, were you not? I was, indeed. <laughs> and uh, when you read about all this, did it uh, make you remember what happened back in 1973? When no. <laughs> it, it did not. <laughs> it did not <laughs> rise to the level of removing our Archibald Cox uh, who refused to accept some watered-down and diluted uh, substitution for getting the tape-recorded evidence of criminality, as it turned out, uh, from President Nixon's White House. Uh, I don't think there can be any comparison in terms of uh, motive uh, or uh, criminality here. Well, even though they wanted to fire uh, Pat Fitzgerald and, uh, during the Libby, uh, well, investigation. one individual's <laughs> aspirations, I don't think, rose uh, to a they. I think, uh, once again, uh, Mr. Sampson, uh, the political apparatchik and uh, lapdog as he was trying to curry favor uh, with Karl Rove and others, uh, put the notion forward that maybe Mr. Fitzgerald uh, mm -hmm. Uh, should be fired along with the others and was met with a rather appropriately stony uh, silence. Uh, had this occurred been in New York, uh, you would expect some expletives yeah. to accompany that. <laughs> well, I'm afraid we've uh, run out of time, but I have a question for you. Uh, do you think Gonzalez will resign after the hearing? I don't predict it. I think he now uh, has an uphill battle. He has lost the confidence of members uh, of the Republican Party. Uh, Senator Specter has withheld judgment, but if you uh, talk about uh, uh, having a fair hearing before a hanging, as uh, Senator Specter has, it's not a good indication for Mr. Gonzalez. Richard Benvenisti, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you. It was wonderful, and thank you for coming by. I'm Jim Zirin. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. Good night and all the best.